welcome back, Jim. Glad to Thank have you. you. Thanks Thank for reaching you. out. Good to see you again. It's been quite a journey. And as you were just saying, once you see it, you can't not see it. Yeah. And then the rabbit holes can get pretty gnarly. Absolutely. You get more. Yeah. For every question you have, you get three more questions. And the absurdity of the narrative just smacks you in the face. And everywhere you look, and it's the same story. It's like they caught the, the playbook, do, 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 do. any town, city, anywhere in the North American realm, you can pretty much write the playbook. And that's exactly right. That's all they have is a playbook. That's yeah. that's it. And they've been doing it for so long. They're practiced at it. Yeah. But they have no creativity. None. They got to borrow our creativity and, and tweak it a bit. Yeah. And they overreach. And, you know, it's it's like the emperor has no clothes. Now that people can see the patterns and see what's going on, then they still do it. They're going through the motions. They're trying. Yeah. And I see the trend continuing. Uh, there's a primary going on in South Carolina, and I'm seeing where the voting machines or the computer or the Internet's down, and they're like, leave them yeah. in this bin. And, you know, we've... Those of us that have been watching elections here the last couple of years, like especially in my state in Arizona, been there, done that. And, you know, still a lot of questions about that. But I'm just giving that as an example, as a pattern that is repeating. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, it's like, well, we got away with it before. We can still get away with it. Um, yeah. But it's harder and harder to do that when people when know. your base goes from 80 percent to 70 to 60 and whatever. Right. Yeah. It's that you're losing your narrative. You're losing control of your narrative. And it's to see the wheels fall off is, is hilarious. Like, yeah. So. Yeah. So they're they're done losing it. <laughs> yeah. so, so and uh, like with you, your guys time and expertise to look into this stuff is amazing. And. Through you, I've discovered Chris, a fellow a fellow Canuck from BC, um, who's fascinating. So I'm looking forward to having a chat because he did a video on Edmonton. So we're going to compare notes and take, great. take go down the rabbit hole a little bit further. And the as as our Schumann resonance rises, everybody's more ripe for this. And like we talked about for the the anxiety and some of the challenges when you're out of sync with the rising. You know, we haven't quite hit the 13.13 hertz yet, but I can feel it ramping up and, and it's some tough times and you kind of got to sweat it out. And, and if you, if you have your connection to spirit, like your pineal lens intact, I think it's much easier. The poor people that are, are so damaged, you know, if, if you don't have a, you know, if you don't have a, a, a an understanding or faith of higher power, you're just a rat in a maze. And it's, it's a, it's a cruel existence. It really is. Yeah. So I, 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 I feel for those people, but. For, from, for myself, it's I, I, I'm taking steps to detox and trying to raise my vibration. I, I used to be a big beer drinker. I gave it up and it took a few months to get out of my system. And I think, you know, and then I've been looking into parasites and stuff like that. So my 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 passion right now is I, I'm really into uh, restructuring and working with water and frequency. And, and the frequencies I like to work with are the sulfagios and the five brainwave states, especially delta. Um, but my side hobby, as far as architecture and, and the, the hilariousness of the narrative, I'd like to, when I find some gems to contribute to the conversation, that's when I'll reach out with you and say, hey, look at what I found and, you know, contribute that way. And uh, yeah, so I got a short PowerPoint with some slides. Shouldn't take too long, but uh, I, I wanted to kind of focus in on a few and I could have picked anything, but I just picked a few and then started digging into them and I got some results of where I've got, and I'd love to know your opinion and some readers' opinions. And uh, let's do this. That's great. Or, or, um, it's set for you to share the screen. So okay. go ahead and ramp it up. All right. And, uh, like I said, I got a tow truck driver out back, and I got my little four-year-old, so I hope I don't get too much distraction. But this shouldn't take too long. Ronnie might, Ronan might come by and say hi. Uh, love your license plates. Thank you. Thank That's you. Cool. One of the stories even involves license plates that there, the synchronicities that and uh, jo uh, Joseph Campbell talked about this is that once you start looking for synchronicities, they start coming at you. And, you know, it's the challenge is to get out of your head, <laughs> which is easier said than done. Believe me, I know. 
And while you're getting that set up, I just want to mention uh, Chris Kelly with Old World Exploration that you're going to be talking to has published some coffee table books. Um, hmm. 101 Demolished Buildings in Old World North America and another 101, the same thing. And he's oh. done an excellent job of yeah. compiling these examples that you can just put on your coffee table and have somebody pick up and look at the beautiful buildings that are no longer with us. <laughs> and wonder how the heck they and built that in see, a year. And, <laughs> and see what he has to say <laughs> from his research of what we're told about them. And, um, you know, for the person you're trying to red pill in your life, um, it's really a, a nice starting point. And I, I believe they're available on Amazon. So, I can't so. zoom, but I, I don't know how to unzoom it, but whatever, we're going to share screen. So. Can we see that? I can see it. Okay, so pulling the threads. So let's look at a few examples and uh, see if we uh, see some patterns and what's going on. So the city of Edmonton population, a couple of ones to keep this reference in mind in your head when you're looking at these buildings, because this is the time frame we're going to be looking at. And some of the key ones are 1895, 1165 people only. And uh, 1911 to 1912, do you notice it goes up by about 240%. And the official narrative says that they annexed, annexed Strathcona, but it only had 5,500 people at that time. So there's a significant new, uh, whether that's infant trains or other shenanigans or snipped timelines or, you know, who trusts, who trusts stats can anyways, man, like, come on. Okay, so we'll start with uh, 1880, terrible resolution, but I'll read it. Uh, it talks about the census, the maps. The census so far as gives the adult population in Edmonton and Fort Sask as 275 people. As a considerable number of half-breeds have taken the treaty, the population will not appear to be as numerous as it really is. So the first BS in their stats is that if you had any kind of Indian blood in you, they didn't count yet. And that's, this is 1880. Um, the newspapers that were out then for this, the meager population was unreal, including two French ones. A lot of these are available uh, in the archives. Talks about an old windmill going back to 1850 run by steam power or 1830. Yeah, there's definitely something going on with windmills. Yeah. Uh, and it's probably part of the original energy grid, but they, in, in many cases, you know, demolished them or took the, mm -hmm. the, the fins down or whatever they're called. I think they were using it to restructure the water. They, they would capture the water along the route, do some work with it, and return it to the to its source, and use it for other things too. the The rollout of a uh, of booze to the narrative. This is hilarious. 1880. We don't like to mention it, but quite a large number of citizens of Edmonton and vicinity were more or less, principally more drunk on Christmas Eve and day. So you you know, you you move in a bunch of people to do God knows what, and get them drunk. And if they don't tow the line, you haul them to the isolation hospital or the sanitarium or the penitentiary. You know, it, it uh, you can kind of see the one, two, three punch that they were pulling. And I'm seeing the same thing, Jim. You know, make alcohol freely available to everybody. You know, Molson got started like 1786, something like that, yeah. 1780s. And, you know, pretty soon he's cranking it out and getting and I, involved in other things like railroads and steamship. And then, unfortunately, with what you were just saying with the institutions, the asylums, the prisons, the workhouses, the mills, you know, it was not a happy time for humanity during that time period. Yeah. And, and we know from other cultures, when you introduce booze to a culture that isn't used to it, you know, they end up with type 2 diabetes and, you know, a lot of problems in the community, health issues and stuff. And I can see that's what happened. If they're rolling out booze and, and inflicting it on a population, then they would have needed all those hospitals and sanitariums. And I'm sure there was programming going on too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And same thing with candy. Yeah, yeah, roll out the rock. Uh, candy that was all coming in candy. about the same period of time. Yeah, and you, you look at bones, you know, pre all of this and the teeth are wonderful. And then all of a sudden you can tell when it's sugar is introduced to the population. You know, and the other thing is the graveyards. When you look at the graveyards in the oldest graves, 18-something, 
uh, a higher consciousness civilization would not bury its dead and not and pat yourself on the back with a gravestone. That's why, you know, they would they would uh, cremate you and plant a tree with you or something like. As far as when they took over, like we got Lac Saint Anne, eighteen forty two, seems to be when the official date where they rolled in and set up shop. That's when you start seeing the graves. You're not going to see a sixteen hundred grave around here. The Indians didn't bury people. So. Okay, so uh, another article, brick mayor, brick makers. So, of course, Edmonton and its major population happens to have a crap load of brick. I think there's about four brick companies, so the story goes, back to the 1880s. So, 1901, this dude is selling two machines that do 10,000 a day, and he's putting in larger machines, plural. So, how many bricks are you making? How the heck are you hauling them? The train hasn't even got in here yet, but you're pumping out hundreds of thousands of bricks every week. The other thing is they were selling off complete properties and businesses furnished. Um, this one article from 1901 shows all the lots. And, and there's another one where it has something like 56 businesses for sale. So you just head, you do your head scratch of like, we're eking off the land and there's soup kitchens everywhere, but you're selling off complete houses and lots and businesses. So, come on. Uh, just a quick question, Jim. Are there uh, many uh, brick streets left in Edmonton? There, you In the old pictures, you can only see uh, dirt, and there's a reason for that. I mean, I think there would have been brick, but I, I do have one working theory why there isn't. I'll get to that, too. Um, terrible resolution, but this chief, so the story was they were all starved, and nobody knew how to really farm, and they set up these the, the, the Indians on the reserves, and then they shuffle them around, and... Um, the story was is that you would go to a government farmer and he would give you provisions for a hunt and you had to give up half your yield to him. So this chief was going around getting provisions and then going to another one and then going home and pocketing the money. I thought it was kind of a cute story. And then the, the top one is about an Indian boys race 50 yards for candies was, was contended by two youngsters. But as our paper is small, we are unable to afford space for their names. January 31st, 1902. That's a fair number of uh, secret societies operating in and around here. And I have no idea what AOUW is or AOF. And I thought IOF was the Odd Fellows, but it says Odd Fellows up top. So if anybody knows what any of these are, that let me know. My my gut tells me the builders were the Knights of Pythias, but um, the, the, the Masons get a lot of the attention, but quietly lurking in the background are the Boilermakers and Pipe Fitters. So I think the there's some there's some there's some uh some gold and then yeah that's what i've been finding as well as some of those on there i've not seen before but i've come across the odd fellows and the knights of pythias and the elks and the woodmen as being resetters i mean somebody had to come in and make this place livable yeah and, you know this is all over so yeah and they have strange mottos like the odd fellows we command you to visit the sick and relieve the distressed and bury the dead and educate the orphan. Yeah. And it's like, what? Yeah. Join the magic. Like, yeah, it's crazy. You know, and it doesn't make any sense until you put it into perspective of what we're looking at with mm -hmm. the historical reset, you know, something happened and they had to, you know, so, so bring then, it back online. Yeah, and one would ask, well, how, how do you program a new population? Well, this article on the right, the government grant under the new laws based on the regularity of attendance of the pupils. They were doing the residential school game for everybody. Therefore, we ask all parents and their kids. If the promotions will be based. So they got a grant for you to go to school regularly. So they hounded everybody. And that's why they dragged all the Indians off all the reserves into the residential schools. They got a fee for that. And that's the way to make sure the programming is reached by all. Right. And, and make uh, it compulsory. <laughs> yeah. And we'll touch a little bit of the residential school thing and um, the the groups that organize that. And you, you get into the Society of New England and some real, they're like the Bill Gates Foundation of the day. So the, 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 we're getting a bit of a sketch. So Soup kitchen, 1880. It was subsistence living out here. We get winter seven months of the year. The frost line's four feet. This is funny. The soup kitchen is at present conducted at the fort, is proving a great success. The finny monsters from Pigeon Lake are boiled up holus bolus, which is quite a savings of labor and material for the department. I'm going to start using that word holus bolus. It's a good one. They were running soup kitchens all around because everybody was starving. It was a harsh climate. 
Um, but at the same time, we're putting up these giant buildings and bringing in marble from Ohio. So that's juxtaposition of that. Uh, this one's interesting. I'll just kind of skim through it. People can pause it if they want. It's tough to read. So they're given all these reasons why they want to move a reserve about 100 kilometers east of Edmonton. And then the very end, a fifth reason might be added because the land is needed by better men. So that's, there's some racism from 1881. Da, da, da. Here's a case. And this is where a lot of the papers, you, you, you wonder if there's filler in it. Um, this is a guy who got fined a dollar for singing out a tune in church. And I, I didn't catch the year on this. I'm thinking 1924, but I'm not sure. Make sure you sing in tune in church, Michelle. Here's a good one. I won't read through all of this, but if, if people want to pause this and have a look. So this guy, Professor Wiggins, he claimed to develop Wi-Fi, basically, where he mounted towers or something on hills. And they connected through the something, the, 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 the etheric energy and the, and the Earth's magnetics or something. And Marconi stole his idea and buried it or did whatever. Well, I, the Marconi was the finer measurement of, of electrical frequency or something. But good article where you can see where they marginalized this guy. And this guy had Wi-Fi figured out in 1902. Uh, get into maps. So the maps of Edmonton typically follow the same narrative as this one. Here's a map of sketch. 1879, same thing, a few roads, kind of what you would expect. Um, here it is, 1883, 1903, 1908, 1910, and then drum roll, da da da, da boom, 19, whoops, 1911, there you go, you get a city of 600,000 people with the streets and even the subdivision names exactly as they are now. So to think of who, uh, who surveyed and, and sketched all this out is just uh, it's mind boggling. And they don't even, I'll go to the 13 one because it's got the best resolution, but they're both the same. The 13 one, they don't even note the hospitals and stuff on here. So you wonder who this Mundy company that did this and where they got all this information from. When you do dig dives into maps, I found out just very recently that they, they do remote viewing and always have for maps. So that's a whole another rabbit hole of who's gathering this information and how, because you're certainly not walking the ground with the transit and whatnot, sketching all this out. It's crazy. The health uh, Hudson's Bay Company took this beautiful section in the middle of it. That looks like the Versailles Palace, and in the picture on the right, you can see where the two uh, the two roads meet, where, where it ends. And this was an airport for the longest time, and just shut down about ten or twenty years ago. I think before that, it might have had zeppelins. Who knows? Um, so a couple of the the highlights: um, 1911 to 12, population went up by about 240 percent. Right along just at Edmonton and Strathcona across the river, there was 200 active mines operating in the late 1800s. They're also mining all over the, the town site as well. And why you would need hundreds of mines to support that kind of population, to me, reeks of looting. So if you notice that, that and there's very few pictures of Fort Edmonton, there are supposedly five of them. They like to use the magic number of five. And you'll notice that the hilltop all along Edmonton, both sides of the riverbank, is this rough dirt, no trees, no scrub brush, nothing. And it goes up to about 200 feet just at the town site. And then when you go east or west, it goes back down and you might have your usual 5 to 20 feet of embankment. So it appears that the town site got dumped on hard so that the old, the old city could be 150 feet down as is evidence where when they were digging into the old mine shaft that they were finding coal seams that have been worked on before. Yeah, and, and that's pretty much what I'm really delving into right now. Just abundantly clear that they got what they could of the grid up and running, streetcars and things like that, and railroads, and they were mining at the same time. Uh, they needed a replacement energy source that had been taken out from the original yeah. grid system. And they and, just mined it until there wasn't anything left. Yeah. And, and then so all the gold and the diamonds and God knows whatever else that they found down there, the technology. and Yeah, they were yeah. hard at that. Yeah. And then once it was all gone, you know, turn it into a park, turn or it into course. a recreational exactly. trail, yeah. rail trail. Very golf course. If it's on any kind of energy point, throw a church on there. Yeah, they had kind of the standard game. Uh, so a funicular, they had a great idea to build a funicular. Not you know, not that anybody's done that anywhere else in North America. So there's some pictures. The thing only lasted a total of four years, even the even the planning. And the really interesting thing is that it ran on an 80 horsepower steam engine. Only thing yeah. that I 
But where the heck did they get the steam engine from? And then, and then mothballed it two years later. Uh, the link there, there's an eight minute video by a local historian who, who, you know, it's mainstream narrative, but it's a good video. Here's some other photos of it. Kind of the same that you see in Pittsburgh and Cleveland and everywhere else. Uh, this building here was just renovated, uh, or whatever you call it, renovated uh, recently. So 1909, the ironworks. And if you notice the uh, to the right of the front door, you notice, can you see my mouse? Where it says garage, mm -hmm. and then there's there's this little corner thing sitting out here. Yep, I see it. So when you go to the next picture, it, it's not in any of the any of the other photos. And then the one the one with the photo, these guys are kind of blocking it. So you wonder what the heck is really there, what they're doing. And I don't know that this building, other than the main floor, it doesn't really look much like what they ended up with, but which it's what they give us for construction photos with the you know white skies. So that one really looks like early cut and paste. Yeah. And you know, and the cur the curving trusses up top, it just looks like a different building, but who knows? You know, in 1909, iron is three times as expensive and three times as heavy, but, you know, they, they needed the iron beams in there. They're still there. They, where's that building? Is that the same one that yep, we've been looking so, at? Yeah, and so this is uh, right downtown Edmonton. They, when they did the reno, they uncovered this, uh, go they called it a ghost wall. It was a buried wall hidden. They don't know how long. And you can see where they put a wall up, and you see the, uh, looks like the melted brick damage here. Mm -hmm. And they just hit it painted this section and then put a wall up to hide this section, but it was structurally fine. So they left it to this day. Basement boiler in 1909, they were able to haul in this bad boy. And interestingly, and this is another rabbit hole, uh, Brantford, Canada, which used to be the head of the Iroquois Confederacy. So it was an important site for years. And I only know this because I grew up there and it was a Mecca of heavy industry. Off the top of my head, you had Massey Harris, Massey Ferguson, White Farm Equipment, Crane Canada, Hussman, uh, Penman's, SC Johnson, Harding Carpets, which is applied all the carpet in Canada. And I could go on and on. And this town, and, and it's basically growing up there, there's 50, 60,000 people there. I think it's about 100 now. The Brantford site is the home of the most infamous residential school in Canadian history, the Mohawk Residential School, where they were bringing in people from all over Canada, Inuit and everything. How are you, in turn of the century, how are you hauling a couple of Inuit kids? Like, how are you getting them there and why? And the only kind of connection I can come to is that the Mohawk were known for, to be fearless of heights and they use them in the high rise construction. And it's like, there's your link to the builders and the builder peoples, it's probably the Mohawk. More than that, I, there's not many pieces of the puzzle yet. But I'd like to do a video on Brantford because Brantford mercilessly destroyed their old world buildings and it had some amazing stuff but with the, the, all the heavy industry in there. And it ran strong until NAFTA took it all out. Uh, Crane Canada. I don't know if this valve is from this building, but uh, the, the, the official narrative is that they used that symbol from 1910 to 1936. You can see it's the old world electrical symbol. Um, here's some uh, heat damage on the back of the Ironworks building. Before you go on, I just want to say with you mentioned NAFTA, it makes you wonder what that was really about too. Take out the rest. Yeah, move yeah. all the all the heavy industry to Asia so you can take out the rest of these buildings so that we don't ask too many questions. Uh this here's a good one. Le Marchand Mansion. Uh the story goes, Rene, this guy Rene Le Marchand, he was a butler for a wealthy Parisian. And this wealthy Parisian would only use a straight razor once and then discard it. So that when he died, Rennie inherited a stockpile of all his used razors. And so he used those that money that he got from those razors to emigrate to Edmonton in 1905. And he just decided to build this with his money. <laughs> and, and Chris shows, I think, the exact same building in Winnipeg. Hard to see, get a backside picture of this. Uh, that's the one picture of the backside that I can see, and it looks pretty old and pretty well worked. You know, I don't think they ever figured this information would be readily available on the internet. And no. so they just kind of yeah. shared stories. Yeah. And you know, who's going to compare notes of the <laughs> same building 100 miles away? Eh? And so, and we'll get into a lot of those. There's there's a lot. It's like I, said, these, I just grabbed a random five or 10 stories and ran with it, but. The more you dig, the more you find. This is a good or the Royal Alexander Hospital. 
Yeah. Um, the architect, uh, same narrative. He came into Edmonton in 1907, got drafted and went to war and died in 1916. And in all that time, he managed to do 43 major projects in two provinces, including some jaw-dropping buildings. So this one here, that picture in the top right, supposedly they started it in June. They had all the big wigs, and there's a picture of it as a field, supposedly. You can see September 22nd, 1910, the big wigs are putting the cornerstone in. And then bam, April 11th, the building is done. To the left, so they built the smoke smokestack and, and this thing, and, and there's a women's pavilion in the back. So we get four months of, of permafrost. And when you dig foundation, or you dig a, in, even a ditch in winter, um, up until the 1970s, the, 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 the only process they would follow mostly is... Uh, kerosene straw and coal they would put they would dump it on the ground and light it and leave it for a day or whatever dig that area move on to the next area so you're telling me that sub trades put plumbing dug a foundation put pilings down at least two more stories right and they thought the ground to do that and did it with horse and wagon and shovels and aims shovels and again it was built by this guy They seem to have certain ones that get yeah. credit oh, for the architecture in a given any given town. Absolutely. There's a great website which outlines all the works in history of all the architects from 18, like 1800 to 1950. I think I have a link coming up. And uh, there was, of course, this guy also worked out of the building he, he built, right? 1909, he, that was his address. And so the hospital, the top right one, that's from the 20s. So they built that other wing. And then you can see an aerial in the 1920s. Yeah, Edmonton, uh, emigrated Edmonton 06, 43 major projects, died at age 39. Uh, the parallel story, um, John Levy's got one about George Connolly in Guelph, Ontario, exact same thing. That built, you know, fell off, you know, built 40 awesome buildings and then fell off a ladder and died. Uh, Edmonton General, 1895, population was 1,165 people. The train didn't even come yet so for another 10 years. And then you can see in 1908, they doubled it. And this was the story. My screen's kind of cut off, but it was it was the Grey Nuns. And the Grey Nuns, uh, they were called a couple names. It was the the Grey people and the, or the drunkards or something, because supposedly the head of the order was, a, was a, an alcoholic or something. There's a little bit of a strange history. You have their own video on the Grey Nuns. Been around since the early 1700s. Oh, and St. Albert, Alberta had a hospital years before this place did. Don't know where. Or um, so, right, the Oliver Isolation Hospital, downtown Edmonton. So you couldn't handle your booze or the new narrative. That's where they sent you. And they ironically built the same one 120 kilometers away in Vagerville, Alberta. And if you look closely at the building, other than some facading differences, they're the same building. Uh, a lot of buildings never went past the planning stage, but they were in the works. So here's one police station, 1913, uh, Terracotta Cathedral, 1910, the Royal Alexander Hotel, 1912. That's a big bugger, about 15 stories high. The Strathcona Hospital is in the works for open 07 to 23. Northern Club, the Ald Building. Okay, let's get into schools. Edmonton School, 1881. Here's the narrative school. You can, in 1881, there was well, about 200 people. And then in 1895, you get uh, 1165. So the first school, which they don't really mention that much, is the Niblock School of South Edmonton. This would have been in Strathcona. Strathcona didn't even have the census in 1891. So how the heck they built this and who built it? In 1895, there was only 500 people. But there she be, nestled in amongst the other buildings. And you can see like a lot of a lot of these buildings are late 1800s. College Ave School, 1895, Queens uh, 1902. You know, when you live in Edmonton, apparently you've got to build a gingerbread castle for a school. That's all you're allowed to do. Brandon School, 1902. McKay School, 04. Duggan School, 06. Now, if you notice Duggan and Brandon, this is on the official city webpage. It's the same school. The write-up is different, different architect, all that stuff, but it's the same picture. So when you dig a little deeper into the pictures of these schools, hard to tell what the heck went on. 
like here's here it is it had it's had an addition but you can see the beginning of it so i don't know what they're doing there's a lot of duplicate buildings alex taylor in 07 norwood 08 strathcona collegiate institute and keep in mind our population statistics and that it's winter seven months of the year here Edmonton High School. This is another Roland Lines building, jaw-dropping gorgeous and huge. So he built this in his spare time in 1910. Oliver School, 1910. And note the farmer plow out front. Love it. Oliver, there's a fresh, fresh orphan faces right off the train, ready to get deep, ready to get programmed. So sad. It's like everybody wears hats, eh? It's I wonder I've my my working theory on the hat thing is that since they made them with uh, felt and lead, yeah, perhaps could have been a way to to prevent our connection to higher consciousness and and toxic and be toxic. That was part of it, and they used things like mercury in the hat making process and things yeah, like that. Yeah. So is it mercury, not lead? Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. Milliners. North Edmonton, 1910. Macaulay School, 1911. Alberta College South, 11, Brotherford, 11, Bennett, 12, Parkdale, 12, Ritchie School, same school. What yeah. the heck? And then you look at them, you look at the archives, and here's what, listen, it looks like they built a third story on the corner of the building or something. And looking at the architectural style of all these places, I can think of a half dozen examples in other places that I've seen. Donald Ross School, 13. Donald Ross and the Bennett schools sure look a heck of a lot alike. They had such a success on the first building, they decided to copy it on a second. H.A. Gray, there's some really good gingerbread castles here. So. Highland School. This was on the outskirts. There was nothing here. And Beverly, Alberta was in the east end of town and didn't get annexed till 1955 and only had 5,000 people then. So why they needed this massive school is beyond me. John A. McDonald, that's a big bugger. King Edward, Westmount School, and that's it for school. So you can see that the preparatory for to haul in the orphans or God knows whoever came in, they jammed in the infrastructure in, in a decade, basically. It's fascinating. Uh, the, the Railway Hotel, it has a bit of a Mandela effect on the narrative. Since then, they've apparently tore down six stories and built six stories again on it. So my son told me that just recently. So you notice on the side, there's a loading dock on the side. This, mm -hmm. this, that loading dock vanished and nobody knows when it did. There, there is, they give us a few token construction photos. I'm assuming they called it the Grand Trunk Pacific Hotel. Or the All right, grainy old photos. So you notice here, so the one on the right is a more modern one as it stands. And originally it had a loading dock and nobody knows when and it got deleted. Yeah. I think those loading docks, uh, other examples I've seen as well, are probably just subfloors. Yeah. Um, obscure rails. They were running the rail systems right in and sometimes through the buildings. So if you look at the old maps, they're showing trunks going right through, right through streets. And you can see the one on the right that goes right through the block. There's another one showing it over here, going right through these three buildings and ending on ending at 101st Ave. There's another one. And then the remnants, you can still see the remnants of all the old loading docks in the old buildings. So it'd be amazing with these having rail access to them. Okay, bricks. Let's touch upon bricks for a bit. Capacity, 10,000 a day. Reason for selling, I'm putting in machines of larger capacity. So, oh, the whole brick thing goes back to like late 1700s with that guy basically developing the cement mixer to mass produce them. It kind of rolls out from there. So there's all these massive brick machines and they're they're pumping them out. This is a brick found locally. Nobody knows where it's from. B&O isn't on the registry anywhere. I grabbed a couple of bricks that I found laying around and most of them that I've seen are just are plain. They don't have any marking stamps on, but apparently they were pumping them out so fast they didn't have the time to stamp them. Well, that's definitely the story they tell us. I have a lot of questions about that particular subject because it would yeah. seem like they were, like I asked about the streets earlier, that they there would have been a, 
an energetic reason for them. Yeah. Well, and I think there is a need to replace out the old brick wherever they could. Because the old brick, if you went heavy on the iron oxide and the silica or quartz, it would function as a battery. And you put in 5 million DC volts through that, you're going to do something to that brick. So it would be interesting to get a hold of some old original brick and see and do an analysis and see what it's made of and if it's any different. Because, I mean, you can take pictures or film old brick buildings and see the magnetic patterns in the in the bricks. Yeah. You can't see it without help like that. Yeah. Somebody might be able to. I'm not one of them. Well, but it, it is picked up by camera. Absolutely. And I would I would add to that another anecdote of that is that in the old world's fair when they showed them lit up, you know, basically they're lighting up every 20th brick. And I mean no, nobody is stringing lights on all that stuff. It's they were they were juicing power through the buildings and I don't know if every 20th brick had was more magnetic and, and functioned as a battery or they could just pulse the power so that it only lit up what they wanted to light up. Uh, downtown in the middle of an alley near the greasiest nudie bar in Edmonton is a horse chestnut tree. As a, as a It's called the hollow watch tree. I have no idea why. I, I got a popular Ukrainian name around here. So this thing's that I figure it's about 150 years old. And sitting in an alley next to this guy, and this guy is a legend in Edmonton who ran this place for decades and even had his wife as a stripper there. And maybe for the, the 18 plus show we, we do one day, I'll tell the story about her last stripping experience because the guy I worked with was there for that day and it was, it was both disgusting and hilarious. The sign on the right, I love the old neon signs. That one's hilarious. I would love to have that sign with the dancing girl. <laughs> And it's uh, it looks like a bit of a classic mud flutter, half down. Um, the bottom left, there. Uh, I'm guessing this is a, an alternative bar in the basement, which is kind of classy joint. So, and then right across the street from this hollow ash tree is the 1901 Knox Church. And if you notice the brick on the side, the official narrative is that Edmonton produced crappy bricks, but they also produced good bricks. So the front of this 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 is I don't know if this is side, but this is good brick, and the and on the back is bad brick. We're telling us, and to me, that just looks like it was replaced. But what do I know? There's another heritage tree that looks like about a 250 year old cypress tree, but there's snow covering it. They've chopped it down. But you know how cypresses were hollow in the middle. This one's about five feet diameter, and the whole middle is hollow. It doesn't look rotted out hollow. It looks like it was always hollow. And there is cypress south in Alberta, so that's my guess is that it's a cypress. So there's an energy point around here with all these buildings. And about another 100 meters or so is the Masonic, Masonic, the first Masonic Lodge, too. And it could be the tree. It yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know if all of these or any of these are from Edmonton, but I found these. And I've never seen a three-way switch. I just thought it was super awesome. I, wish we, I don't think we do this anymore. That's some serious engineering. Now, next is my love of uh, my love of license plates is I found this uh, it says 1954 Marion year in 1954, Alberta put out a promotion for the 4-H club where they sold a plate from your hometown for a buck and, and went to charity. And every town had its own slogan. There's no production figures. So a collector and historian, it's great because every now and again, a new town will surface and nobody knows how many are out there. So I've been collecting for several years, and I know all the 54s. It was an orange and black hair color. All of a sudden, about three months ago, out of southern Alberta, around Lethbridge, these 1954 Marion Year plates show up. So I start looking into this. And so the Marion Year, the first time ever by the Catholic Church, they decided it's a year where you need to, to worship the Virgin Mary extra, extra. And, and But it's optional if you want to buy into it. So Lethbridge, and there's one church in Edmonton that changed its name, and Alberta seemed to be on board with it. He did it. They did it a second time, 33 years later. And you can see it's very specific dates they're running this. Um, the first one ran December 53 to December 54, and then the other one ran June to August. So... They're trying to raise energy for something because they're encouraging pilgrimages and celebrations and all this. So they're generating energy for something. I'll let other people put their things make there's some suggestions. The the Marian year, the, the Salus Populi Romani, 
to me, that's some creepy looking characters there. And the, the little the little character looks just like a little version of a big character. So I, I don't know what's up with that. And the last time we talked, you looked at that location at Lac Saint Anne, Mm -hmm. which is a Catholic pilgrimage site. Absolutely. And a lot of questions that you asked during that and showed us what was there. And it is like, I, I agree, it was pretty creepy. Yeah, there's the some, statues that, and that one where he's either giving birth to the world or, or swallowing the world. I mean, yeah, that's some creepy stuff. I should add that photo back into this thing. So, okay, why do you call it a Marian year? Like, okay, I get the suffix and of Mary or whatever, but that's a stretch. Like, why would he just call it the year of Mary or Mary's year? So, again, I don't know much about numerology and all that stuff, but I thought, well, I'll get into the Gematria calculator and see what comes up. So the, the top response for Gematria for that word Marian is Moloch. Oh, really? <laughs> and, and the screen's cut off, but like the neck, the second highest search result is like four times less in numbers. So again, when you ask, well, what is Moloch? Well, it just happens to be the king mm. of the holy child sacrifice. <laughs> and then 33 years later, they did it again. I would encourage people to look for look at famous people born in 1954. It's interesting. Uh, Clover Bar Bridge, hilarious. Full write up in the newspaper about how they did it. They dredged and did the caissons. And their story was one set one story. The article goes on to say, "Well, we dug down, you know, eleven feet, and then there was a little bit of sand, and then there's bedrock. So, you know, we could just put the bridge there." And then later on, they're talking about um, having to put sixty-seven pilings in it, and this and that, on just the south pier and all that. So, how how are you building those caissons in that whole bridge in less than two years? It's amazing. But yet they have a full narrative in the newspaper, the Evans and Bulletin. Right. You know, and that's the thing. It's almost like they try to dazzle you with details mm -hmm. and you read it. And, yeah. you know, I was saying earlier when they shadow banned my video by bombarding it with ads, you know, it's like it, you know, turns people, it's like, I'm not going to watch this. And, you know, same thing when you read all those details, it's like, I'm not going to read this. <laughs> Yeah, okay, whatever, sure, way above my degree. And that's, you, good point, that's the compartmentalization. They compartmentalize this, and we trust that there's smarter people than us that are doing this stuff, and we don't question it. You know, like, all those neighbors of that hospital, did, did it not dawn on anybody that the next spring the hospital is there? You know, and you dig deeper and you look at Coral Castle or that guy Capability Brown who did all the earth moving in the old, uh, the old English uh, chateaus and all that. They seem to be doing stuff at night. They didn't want anybody around. How are they doing it? Are you talking some high-level conjuring or spell casting? Or perhaps that's what they want the roots to think. And really, the controllers have access to the simulation, and they're just pulling buildings from wherever. So, I don't know. Um, here, this talks about 67 pilings driven for the foundation. You're telling me in 06 they're putting in endless pilings? With what? <laughs> What equipment? What men? 1914, all the surplus men got drafted to war. 10,000. There's nobody here. They, they're still putting up buildings. Um, few, this is our. This is what we get for photographs. Like the construction. That's a nice one. So, like, it seems they seem to be doing something. To me, the hard work is done there, kind of, because they got the caissons already done. I don't know how they dredge that. Are those made out of wood? <laughs> oh, the high level bridge is even bigger. Um, the narrative kind of splits here, where the one says uh, first train into Edmonton was October 1902, and then the other narrative is November 1905. And the mainstream response to this is that the 05 one was for the 1920 something World Exhibition, and it, it was just a promo thing. They knew it was fake. So. I think that's it. I think that's all I got. We were on a road trip this summer, and there's this big earthworks north of Edmonton here where it looks like they tried to make it into a tourist attraction and then decommissioned it. And it's it's quite quite large. <laughs> See, so I don't know what the heck is there. Yeah, well, that's about it, Michelle. That's that's great uh, job, Jim. Not a few rabbit holes, and I'd love to know what other people think. Um, we had talked about the. I wish I had the photo of it, but. In one of the old pictures, there used to be a, a, a there, there's a Bronx neighborhood, 
And, and the street on the other side of the Bronx neighborhood was known as Phoenix Avenue in the old, uh, in the old uh, maps. So Bronx is a bizarre story. The, the Bronx or the Rananaqua Indians that were there originally were known as the end of the earth people. And that, that land was hotly contested by the Dutch and the English. But yet the name they get it from, they said, was from a Swedish explorer two centuries earlier. So it's a bit of a mystery. And I, I, I think the Bronx is some kind of an energy center. And for future reference, they tended to name them that places. So I had a quick look and Winnipeg has a Bronx neighborhood. Montreal has a Bronx neighborhood. And I haven't been able to find anything past that. But if because a lot of the old maps, they've changed their names. But if any viewers know of any old neighborhoods in their towns or cities that uh, they it seems like there was something in that name, the Bronx. And I think why they also called it the Phoenix Avenue, probably referencing the cataclysm cycle or something. This was a highly advanced civilization that was here. And so the resetters, the controllers that came in knew that the energy properties of everything and and so they've been harnessing that energy or harvesting it along with yeah. everybody and, else's energy, everything's and, energy. Yeah, and um, looting in the coal seams, like the looting and you know, probably the old trees that they were mining with the coal and it's absolutely yeah, they, and, they literally raped the old stabilization. I mean, literally from the moment that they came in and started digging everything out that's what they were doing they were getting the railroads back on the canals first and then the railroads mm -hmm. and then when all all of that was exhausted all the coal seams and the iron ore and the gold everything they could get their hands on they didn't need it anymore and they took it out and so um they replaced the rail like i said earlier with trails with roads highways routes highway routes yeah. Um, and and they're still harvesting energy only it wasn't it's not the original energy yeah. grids free energy it's cars it's us it's you know it's yeah. it's everything because that's what they that's what they need for their new energy grid yeah and, and i think they changed the weather too I imagine if you blocked a lot of these ley lines, you're gonna you're gonna cause some significant atmospheric changes. And I'd encourage people to look into Don and Carol Croft, who uh, uh, made made organite and kind of like went toe to toe with the controllers who were doing all the weather modification and and the nuclear power plants. It's a fascinating story. It's online. It's also on a, a site called the Warrior Matrix, which has the whole overview of, of organite going back to Wilhelm Reich, who who did ten years in jail for what he did. So I think when you clamp down on the ley lines and depress the energy and whatnot, I think that's why it's so cold in such an inhospitable climate. You know, like, you know, St. Petersburg, like, you know, why would you build a massive city up there? That's a rough climate, but that's a drop dead gorgeous and huge. Well, 200 years ago, you might've had cypress trees and it was very seasonal. I think that's a really good point, Jim. And the extremes, whether deserts or places that get yeah. You have tons of snow and cold temperatures. I don't think that's the way it was originally. No. And, you know, what's up in the Northwest Territories, right? I mean, you can follow the ley lines. I've, I've tracked some ley, ley lines through that area, and it was there, too. I lived in Fairbanks, Alaska for 11 years, and, you know, you've got the same s-shaped river bends of the china river and when my husband and i canoed through downtown fairbanks back in the 90s when we lived there there were rusted cars on both sides covering the banks and at the time you know this is long before i started waking up to any of this i'm like what you know what did they cover it with you know car park car you know rusty sides of cars and everything so in my and my guess now would be they wanted to cover up the masonry or whatever was there, mm -hmm. but at the time you know, didn't know anything about this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, it just you start looking into it, and there's just so much that just kind of falls out of the ether. 
with regards to the insane stories that they tell. Mm -hmm. And you can see the patterns from city to city and where they borrowed and copied and stuff. And it's almost like Windows cut and paste. Yeah. But it worked. Yep. yep. It worked for a long time. And booze, <laughs> sanitariums, penitentiaries kept you in line. You couldn't make the grade, they'd haul you off. You want you wonder what some of the programming efforts is. Um, you know, from when you look into the residential school stuff, it was I mean, one they were making, you know, they wanted to teach you the white man's culture, but it was also a lot of trauma-based mind control. You know, they they physically and sexually abuse those children. Well, we know now that that's that's to manipulate them, cause get them into split personality states and this and that and make them more controllable. So I think they were in all of the schools. I mean, it's all it's all programming, and you you tie in some Orpheum theaters, of which ninety percent of the films are gone. Well, what was in those films? Right, and Orpheum is putting people to sleep. And yes, that's what, yeah. You know the yeah. Orpheus, the the Greek <laughs> god that was able to charm animals and people with his lyre and harp, and um, and you see Orpheus. So you see the Orpheum theaters all over all over the world, not just in North America. But then outside of Fort McHenry in Baltimore, Maryland, you have a big Orpheus statue. And the same names. You got the Paramount, the Jasper, the Roxy. It's it's the same 15 names. They used them everywhere. Fascinating. Yeah. And and I like I there's about there's about five or ten theaters here around 1905. And it's like you need that many theaters this is subsistence living who's who's got the money to be going to see shows all the time and in weird locations it's like who's putting up all this these film companies and stuff theaters opera houses yeah you yeah. name well, it yeah well, and then, well another rabbit hole and opera. then i think they tossed a coin when it came to whether or not an, a building became a prison or a college because yeah. you have you know penitentiaries that look like higher education yeah institutions yeah put a dome up take a dome off change the facade like it's like it's like their lego kit had 20 buildings and they just kind of morphed them from there and what's even stranger is yes they demolished a lot of buildings and got records of that but they also left a lot standing to rot in place they left uh former trolley parks and amusement parks to deteriorate hotels they didn't take them down and then the same thing with the asylums a lot of the asylums are still standing empty and they have reputations for being haunted so there's a lot of par paranormal activities at this these places so you can only imagine the trauma that people were going through when they were there it wasn't nice whatever was going on was definitely not nice yep. and then they, they bring in horror movies they want this this fear vibe mm -hmm. like we were talking you about earlier lower, lower vibratory state they want this fear by running through us and the ley lines yep. that's their deal that's what they need the, it's 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 psychopathic brilliance because humans only have two emotions love and fear everything is a subset of those two so you program us to think only in fear and you drag our consciousness level down. And then it, and then you seem to be able to have like where you have a lot of unconscious thinking and you, you, you operate on all these belief systems and you don't ask a common sense question. That, Why did that building show up in the spring? What, what you just, you're, you're kind of steered away in our consciousness. If we're unconscious in 70% of our thinking, it can be directed without our even knowing it. And at the same time frame that you were looking at with these buildings, the circuses were coming in. Yeah. So you had those distractions. You're starting to get silent movies in the late 1800s, early 1900s. I think the first silent Western showed up about 1903. You know, so you're more programming. You know, people programming. are going to these matinees, targeting kids. Targeting uh, things really kids. changed. Lower the, the better. Your candy and meat and felt hats, apparently. <laughs> That's funny, that one. I never even thought of that. It's like, why is everybody wearing hats? Like, if, you <laughs> hat, if it's raining, sure, but like, 
they would wear a hat to wear a hat. You could be dirt poor, but you had to have a nice hat. Just think of shows like Little Rascals and when they came out. I mean, I, I grew up on Little Rascals and programs like that. Yeah. Um, you know, with the with the hats and they they were orphans, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, do we did we think see I, I'm I'll be 61 in July, so you know, 60 years ago, was I thinking any of this stuff? No. You know, it was more like I didn't want to go to church, so I watched whatever was on that channel because I didn't want to watch the church shows. And, um, you know, so I ended up watching a lot of that stuff. Looney Tunes, you know, a generation raised on on those cartoons. Um, the, the, there's yeah. just so much. Mel Blanc was a Freemason. Oh, oh, Mel Blanc, yeah. <laughs> they were all Freemasons. He's a 30. Let's, let's cut to the yeah. chase. <laughs> <laughs> a big part of this. And I'm trying to bring more and more attention to that, you know, in terms of the, the major players, you know, and the higher level, higher degree Freemasons, the Shriners, um, you know, the little guys didn't know this stuff. Yeah. But the higher you went up in the secret societies, the more you would know about this this other side that's not presented to the public outside of the hospitals and you know, all the good things they're doing. Yeah. Uh, the one other absurd narrative I didn't touch on um, was Simpton Mall. Uh, June, like summer of 1980, a lot of people lived around there. And it was marshland and little little hills and people would ride their bikes in there. And summer of 81, they built phase one is done and you have a 100,000 square foot massive mall in one year, which even by today's building standards is impossible. And, you, but yet, and yet nobody questioned it. All those neighbors around, they're like, oh, the mall's done, great. It's like, who ran, who did the plumbing? Who ran the gas? Who dug the foundation in the winter? You know, and, and, there, and there's tunnels. Apparently, the owner, original owner of that hotel, Grumesian, of, of the Triple Triple Five Corporation, he took rode a golf cart in a tunnel a few kilometers to, to and from his house. So, again, is that urban legend or not? I don't know. But there is tunnels under that. The, the mall workers in the 90s. There's tons of Reddit threads about that. So the whole thing never stopped getting absurd, I don't think. Yeah. And and that's a good another good point because the tunnels were everywhere. Yeah. And... I was looking at Penn State University and uh, tunnels there and other universities with the story. Well, they were built there for, you know, to heat the sidewalks with steam to melt the snow in the wintertime. And um, some of them are closely monitored and you can't go in or you can only go in for tours or or mm -hmm. whatnot. But um, definitely a lot more to the tunnel story. Yeah, absolutely. But a lot of people are starting to pick up on that and the, you know, the research that's coming out from people like yourself, just taking an interest in what's around you, mm -hmm. all at contributes to this, um, pulling back the veil of all the stuff that's been hidden from us. Yeah, absolutely. Which is an important process. It's, it does matter. <laughs> Truth does matter. Um, for, so people know that they've been lied to about everything. Absolutely. You've done great work on that, Jim. And okay. uh, if you want to do this again, just let me know. Yeah, absolutely. It's been a pleasure. And uh, if anybody, any, I'm welcome any comments, great comments on the last video. And, and it kind of sparked some further interest and stuff to research. So like totally awesome. appreciate it. And always a pleasure to talk with you. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Jim.